Okay, so in that last section, we talked a lot about incentives and, and the motivations for why we do things and how we respond and how we change our behaviors in, in reaction to new policies. Um, but there was no math to that. And one thing that economics likes to do is create models and create ways of thinking about things more systematically um, and trying to measure how people react to things. And so we're going to introduce this concept here called elasticity, which is essentially a mathematical number um, that measures how responsive people are to changes, um, to changes in policies or to changes in prices or to changes in, um, in rules or anything like that. Um, we typically work with elasticity of price um, because that's something that's easy to measure. It's hard to measure elasticity in like motivation um, because how do you measure motivation um, quantitatively? That's tricky. Um, and so what we'll talk about in this little section here is this, this responsiveness to prices. And so if you change the price of something, how do people then respond to that? Do they start doing it more? Do they start doing it less, etc.? Um, so the main question we care about when we think about elasticity is if the price changes, how much does the quantity change? Um, so if you raise the price of something through taxes, like if you raise the price of tobacco um, by, Im by imposing a tobacco tax, how responsive are people to that? Do they start consuming tobacco less, most likely? And if so, how much less? Do they respond just a little bit or do they respond a lot? Um, and we can get an actual number for how responsive people are. And this is this idea of elasticity. So the actual value for elasticity follows this formula here, um, where you take the percent change in demand and divide it by the percent change in price. So if, um, if you implement a tobacco tax, for example, um, and you know that you're increasing um, the price of tobacco by 10%, for instance, um, then you, can, you have 10% change in price there. And if you can measure how much the change in demand um, changes, if you measure like a, a month later, see how much less demand for tobacco there is, then you'll get a number for that. And if you take that change in demand divided by the chain, percent change in price and make it negative, then you get um, a number that shows the elasticity of the thing. Um, if you, you can also do it this way here. This is an alternate formula for elasticity here. If you know the price and the quantity of something, um, and you know the change in quantity and the change in price. It's the same idea here. This is just a, a like you can use algebra to get from this formula to this formula. Um, this is just a, a shorter way of looking at it here that is often more helpful if you just know, like in a problem set question, it says um, the price of something changed and there were 10 things less of it sold and the prices of these things were X and Y. As long as you know those pieces of information, you can just plug those in here, the change in quantity, change in price, the actual price, the actual quantity, and then you can figure out um, the elasticity for it. So the way you interpret this number, um, it, it spits out a single number, and it is the percent change in demand that follows a 1% change in price. So if the elasticity is 2, if that's the number that gets spat out, what you can do is there's essentially a template that you can follow um, with words. So you say if the price increases by 1%, then quantity decreases by 2%. Um, because it's really hard to think about 1% changes in price, like for instance, if a gallon of milk costs $3 and it goes up in price by 1%, that means it goes from $3 to $3.03, isn't a ton and you're not going to make like maybe some people will stop buying it at a one percent increase in price but most people will just buy it the same um, and so what i often do when i look at elastic elasticities is i multiply everything by 10. and so instead of saying how much less of the thing is going to be sold if the price goes up by one percent um, I say how much less of the thing is going to be sold if the price goes up by 10%. So with this gallon of milk, it goes from $3 to $3.30, which is a more sizable jump in price than $0.03. Cents. Um, so in this case, if the elasticity number is 2, the template would be if price increases by 10%, so if it goes from $3 to $3.30, then the quantity decreases by 20%. And so that means lots of people are going to stop buying it, lots more than expected. Um, and so this is something that is highly elastic. 
If the price goes up, people are going to stop buying. If the price goes down, you can use the same template. So if the price decreases by 10%, um, then the quantity will increase by 20%. So if it, gets, if it goes from $3 to $2.70, then tons more people are going to start buying it. Um, and so that's, that's something that is highly elastic. Um, if you have a number like this here, if the elasticity value is 0.5, you can use the same template here. So if the price increases by 10%, then the quantity decreases by 5%. Um, which is not a lot. Like people are still gonna, they're gonna buy less of the thing, but not a ton less of the thing. So if milk goes from $3 to $3.30, some people will stop buying it, but most people will continue to buy it, is essentially what that shows. One thing to remember with this is it assumes that quantity goes up and price goes down or the opposite. Quantity goes down, price goes up. They always move in opposite directions. So if the thing gets more expensive, um, then people will buy less of it. That is something called a normal good. We'll talk about that in future sessions. Um, that's not always the case. You can have um, other types of goods where if the price goes up, people will actually buy more of it. Um, that's the whole theory behind like Louis Vuitton and other like fancy fashion things like Rolexes. Um, the more expensive they are, the more people buy them because it's like a luxury good. Um, and you also have the opposite of that, where if the price goes down, um, people buy less of it. And there, there are other situations. But in, in like normally, we have the situation where if the quantity goes up, price goes down, or if quantity goes down, price goes up. So they always move in opposite directions. So the way you interpret these numbers, um, you have this range, these elasticities, scores, these numbers that you get, range from zero to infinity. Um, they don't go negative, um, and so they have specific meanings. So if if the so we have these five different things here. We have really big elasticity scores. We have elasticity scores of zero, and in the middle we have unit elastic things, which we'll talk about in a minute. So basically, everything is centered around one. If something is greater than one, it means it's elastic. If it's less than one, it means it's inelastic. So if something is perfectly elastic. What this means is any change in price will move the quantity to zero. So if the price goes up by 1%, then the quantity will go away completely. It'll go down a negative, a negative infinity percent. It'll just disappear completely. Um, this doesn't really happen in real life very often to have perfectly elastic goods. Kind of the, the best example of this is if you have two identical goods and the price of one changes. So if you imagine like two vending machines in a hallway and they both have like cans of Coke in them for 50 cents, um, but then for whatever reason, whoever is in charge of the second vending machine next to it decides to raise the price of Coke to a dollar. So you have one vending machine where it's 50 cents and one vending machine where it's a dollar. Um, nobody is going to buy the $1 Coke. Everybody's going to go to the 50 cent Coke. And so that's where like you raise the price for one thing just a little bit and everybody's going to move away from it because there's no reason to buy the more expensive stuff. And so that's something that's perfectly elastic. Um, again, it doesn't really happen in real life, but that's kind of the extreme. If you have perfect elasticity, it means as soon as you change the price to anything, um, then quantity disappears. If you have something that's generally elastic, like a high number, um, anything above one, that means that the change in price, or any changes in price change the quantity a lot. So if you raise the price a little bit, then tons of people will run away from it. If you lower the price a little bit, tons of people are going to start buying it more. Um, and so that, that measures how responsive people are. And so this is, um, if you have a good with lots of substitutes for this, that's a pretty elastic good. Um, so if you go to a restaurant and they, like, if you have good substitutes, you can say, like, I want a Diet Coke. And then they say, but that's going to be like 50 cents more today because there's a shortage. Um, then you'll easily switch to something else, um, to Pepsi or to Sprite or whatever. Um, and because there are other substitutes and so you'll just run away from the product and find something else. Um, and so that, that's this elastic world. Unit elasticity, again, is this hypothetical thing that never really happens. That just means if the price goes up by 10%, then the quantity will go down by 10% exactly, um, which cool, but we don't really care about that so much. Um, what we do care about is when it's less than one. So what this means is changes in price change the quantity just a little bit. Um, so if, your, if prescription medicine, for instance, 
um, if that raises in price by 10%, you're still going to buy it. You're just going to feel sad about it um, and angry because like it's more expensive, but you kind of have to do it and there aren't a lot of substitutes. So any sort of good with few substitutes is going to be inelastic. Um, a classic example in econ textbooks is like AIDS medicine. There's only like one set of drug cocktails that treats AIDS. And so if they raise prices for that, then people will just kind of have to live with it and they get mad at it. Um, we see this in real life um, with um, EpiPens, for instance. Um, for the past couple of years, there's been huge um, increases in the price for EpiPens um, because some venture capitalists bought out um, a patent for EpiPens or the medicine in EpiPens, and so they've been able to jack up prices really, really high um, because they can. And as a result, people are still buying EpiPens because they're like life-saving and you still need them. There aren't good substitutes for it. It's just that people are really kind of angry about it. And so like EpiPens would be an inelastic good. Um, any sort of kind of non-substitutable, very important thing is going to be inelastic. You can't really get away from it. So if you raise the price, you're still going to consume it. Some people won't. And so that's where the quantity goes down. But most people will continue to, to use it. They'll just be like angry about it. Um, so that's the inelastic side. Perfectly elastic, again, is this hypothetical thing where like a change in price does nothing to the quantity. Um, the canonical example from textbooks is like survival goods. So if you have water, if, if you're dying of thirst in the desert and somebody comes up to you and hands you a canteen of water and says, I will sell this to you for a million dollars, you're going to pay a million dollars for it. Um, you're not going to change your, your quantity bought um, because you're desperate for it and you absolutely need it. Um, but again, that's like a contrived example and doesn't super often happen in real life. Um, the, generally, what you need to pay attention to when you think about these, this elasticity thing is anything greater than one is going to be elastic, which means if the price goes up, people will run away from it. Or if the price goes down, people will flock to it. Um, or inelastic if it's less than one, which means if the price goes up, people will sometimes move away from it, but they'll be sad about it. Um, if the price goes down, again, like if the price for EpiPens goes down, people aren't going to go out and hoard EpiPens. Um, that's just not a thing that happens. Um, this came up a few months ago in early 2020. There were um, debates in some southern states about um, whether or not um, uh, sanitary products for females should be cheaper or tax exempt. And some um, politicians were arguing that if we lowered the prices for tampons or pads, then people would go out and flock to them and just like hoard all of the tampons and pads. And that's like really weird logic. Um, that assumes that it's an elastic good, um, but it's not really an elastic good. It's a fairly inelastic good. And so changes in price will change the quantity a little bit, but people aren't going to go out and hoard all of these sanitary products because that's weird. Um, they're inelastic goods. And so it's not something you should be concerned about if you raise or lower the prices for those things. Um, so that's what you should be concerned about here is things that are greater than one or less than one. You don't need to worry so much about kind of exactly one or infinitely huge or zero because those rarely happen in real life. Okay. The reason we care about this for public policy and public administration is it's closely tied to taxes. When you tax things, you raise the price for things. Um, and so what you want to do is if you tax things that are elastic, um, people will buy less of it. Um, if you tax things that are inelastic, people will buy slightly less of it, um, but they'll continue to buy stuff. And so one thing you have to pay attention to is um, if you tax elastic goods, um, and you're trying to rely solely on like the revenues from your taxes, you can actually make it so people stop buying the thing that you're taxing completely, um, which makes it so you have no more revenues. And so that's an issue if you're relying on things on, on taxes on elastic goods. Um, if you tax inelastic goods, then it actually makes the quantities um, go down and it makes it so your revenues don't actually decrease. And so typically what you see in government is governments don't really tax elastic things unless they want to change the demand for it completely. Um, so like 
a few years ago, there were debates about a soda tax. Um, the point of a soda tax was not to raise a whole bunch of revenue from the sale of sugar drinks. It was to reduce the consumption of sugar drinks. Um, so they were purposely trying to raise the raise um, prices of soda so that demand would decrease so that they could get rid of that market or dampen the market. So that was the whole point of soda taxes. It wasn't to make governments rich. It was to change consumer behavior and change the incentives and change preferences. Um, cigarette taxes do the same thing. Um, governments are not trying to rely on cigarette revenue or tax revenue from cigarettes. Um, these are something called a sin tax where they're trying to reduce the consumption of cigarettes or alcohol or soda um, by purposely raising the price of it so that the quantity demanded goes down. So they're trying to make it so fewer people smoke or drink or drink soda um, so that public health gets increased. And so that's like, if you're going to tax elastic goods, that's kind of good examples of that. You're not gonna try to rely on these, these forms of taxes for consistent revenue um, because if you, Again, if you raise the taxes too much, then nobody's going to buy the stuff and you won't have any revenue. Um, but again, that's not the point of these taxes. Um, property taxes, on the other hand, are very inelastic. Um, if, you have, if you own property um, and your taxes go up one year, you're not going to suddenly sell that property and move to a different county where they have... Um, lower property taxes. Some people do, like people who have the ability to own multiple houses and move around to different places, but most of us don't. Um, like I, we just bought our first house moving here to Atlanta and I'm terrified of leaving. And if the taxes go up, they go up and I live with it because I'm not going to spend all of the effort and time. I don't even know what the taxes are. Um, I'm not going to figure that out. I don't have the energy to do it and I don't care and paying for local government and that's great. Um, but you do have large companies where they actually do care and they have kind of the flexibility to do this where sometimes they will like uproot and move to a different city for tax benefits um, because for them, um, the ability to move, they're very elastic with their real estate preferences. Most of us are very inelastic with our real estate preferences. Um, even if you don't own a house, if you rent, um, often landlords know that you are pretty inelastic with um, your housing choices. And so if they raise your rent, there is a risk that you'll move to a different apartment. But most of us don't like moving. And so we're fairly inelastic with our preferences for housing. And so if prices go up, we'll be sad about it, but we'll keep paying to live in the place we're living. Um, unless you personally are super elastic with your real estate preferences. And if, if rent goes up by like a dollar, you're going to move to a different place. That's weird. Um, good for you for being so elastic. Um, but most of us aren't. And so one reason that, um, local governments rely so heavily on property taxes for consistent revenue is because people can't really escape them. Um, it's a tax on an inelastic good. And so we'll be sad about it, but we will still pay it. And so governments can still have consistent revenues. Um, one important thing about all of this elasticity thing here is that those who can, uh, those who can afford to avoid taxes will try to avoid them. Um, so this is again the example of like people who own lots and lots of real estate. If um, if you're a company and your city threatens to raise taxes on you, you can just say, "Fine, we're moving," and you can spend all of the extra money and time to move to a different place to get better taxes for your company. Um, but you can only do that if you have all of the resources and time and lawyers and, and financial experts to do that. Um, if you can't avoid them, then you're going to pay them. And so essentially taxes fall on the people who can't run away from them. Um, and so it raises equity concerns um, because if you're going to be taxing things that are highly um, inelastic for poorer people, that's going to uh, essentially punish poorer people. Um, and so property taxes are great for local, for local government revenues because those are consistent, but they're also like not always perfectly equitable because the rich property owners can move away. Um, and so you're essentially raising um, property taxes on people who are unable to escape those, those changes in prices. And so that's something to consider. Anytime you change the price of anything, 
um, those who are most able to um, avoid changes in prices will do so and they can escape um, increases in taxes, which then means the people who can't escape have to bear more of the burden of the taxes, which is an issue. So keep that in mind. So that's how elasticity basically works. Um, you'll have a couple questions and problem sets in the future um, asking how to calculate these things. Um, again, the only thing you really need to remember is um, it's a scale of zero to one, zero to infinity. Um, anything under one means inelastic. Anything over one means elastic and is more responsive to price changes. Anything less than one is not very responsive to price changes. And that is elasticity.